in the February 2018 edition of What's New Massachusetts. We're going old school as we revisit one of our favorite topics, classic diners in Massachusetts. We'll also take a whack at the latest trend cutting its teeth at new locations in the Bay State. Yes, axe-throwing bars are setting up their chop shops in four cities this year, including Agawam, Marlboro, Everett, and Somerville's Union Square. What's new, Massachusetts? Here are your co-hosts, Sam Baltrusis and Sharon Filia. And welcome to the February edition of What's New, Massachusetts. My name is Sam Baltrusis. I'm an author and journalist. Joining me is my lovely co-host, Sharon Filia. Hi, Sam. Hi, Sharon. <laughs> so we're going to talk about diners. Yes, and we both love diners. So <laughs> let's start with you first, Sam. Okay. Why do you love diners so much? Well, I love the aesthetic of diners. In fact, when I was coming back to Boston in 2007, the first thing I went to was the Rosebud Diner in Davis Square. I'd like, take me to Rosebud, because I had <laughs> fond memories of the Rosebud when I was here in the early ni the 90s. Right, and now the Rosebud Diner, if I remember, has a p particular significance to you? I actually wrote portions of my first book, Ghost to Boston, in the Rosebud Diner. That's when I was living in Davis Square, right. and that's before the renovation. So it's completely different now, but the aesthetic of it's still similar. And and that what's so great about that is the diner, the environment, it allowed you to do that. How many restaurants can you write a book in? Not yeah. many. <laughs> and I'm sure you had some coffee while you were writing. But oh, just, lots of coffee. Right, but just a nice <laughs> environment to relax and just, and you were able to think and write. And I love diners in part of that for that same reason. Nice environment to eat in, relax, good food, good prices. You can bring your friends, talk, have a great time. I love it. Well, you're actually in luck, Sharon, because in Malden, they just renovated a diner called Crazy Good Kitchen. Uh-oh, uh-oh. <laughs> we have to go there and check it out. This is wonderful. I love diners, really. So we're going to go there and interview some people and get some sample their fare. Well, hopefully, if they let, <laughs> it, let us let us in. But it, it's they reno did renovations, and there's multiple diners throughout Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And later on in the show, we're actually going to list our top five diners in Massachusetts. Correct. And we're also going to speak to Mr. Larry Coltrera. We're going to revisit some interviews that we had done with him in the past. Yeah, Larry's a local expert on diners. Uh, yes. He has written two books, mm -hmm. and he is a fantastic resource when it comes to local diners. He does, and you learn, so every time I talk to him, I learn something new. So not only does he critique the diners, but he goes into the history of the diners and even some of the diners that have been used in movies. It's fascinating. So we're going to run the clip, the, my, my first interview with Larry when mm -hmm. we were What's New Malden. Yes. <laughs> Let's check out the clip now is the expert on local diners, Larry Coltrera. Tell me your backstory. What led you to, to write about diners? Well, the writing was way down the road from my initial uh, interest, so to speak. Uh, I was interested in diners from the time I was a, a little kid, probably four or five years old. Uh, my dad actually told me about diners and that they were uh, prefabricated restaurants. They looked somewhat like railroad cars, but they were not railroad cars or converted railroad cars. And so I knew this from a young age and I was very uh, observant when we went on rides in and around the greater Boston area and I noticed all the diners that we had at that time in the late 50s, early 60s. And of course, as time went on, they started to disappear. And by around 1980, I was getting into photography. I started photographing diners as a documentation type of a thing. And uh, in the process, 36 years later, uh, I photographed over 860 diners. Wow. Uh, I started writing a, lo a regular column for the Society for Commercial Archaeology, a, a national organization dealing with roadside businesses and uh, attractions and whatnot. And uh, I wrote the first ever regular column called Diner Hotline for them for uh, around 18 years. I retired that in 2007 and started my blog right after that, which is called Diner Hotline as well. And the, the books came about because of the blog, actually. 
So actually, uh, he, um, Larry writes for the same uh, publishing house that I do, which is History Press, now Arcadia. Yes. And our original commissioning editors were the same, Jeff Saraceno. Yes. So we were, uh, he, he wrote a, his first book, uh, Classic Diners in Massachusetts, um, is what led me to, my, to the publisher. So I was like, that, I love that cover. Um, I saw it at uh, the Rosebud Diner in Somerville. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'm like, I have to work with this, this publishing house. So, so thank you for writing the, that initial <laughs> book. Um, so we focus on Malden. So I know you grew up in, in Medford. Right. Uh, what are your, like, how, what's your experience with the Malden Diners? Well, um, my first real experience with Malden Diners was not until I started photographing uh, Viv's Diner on, on uh, Eastern Avenue in Malden, which is now known as the Lunchbox. Oh, okay. uh, that was my first diner experience, though I do recall the Miss Malden Diner on Main Street near the Sacred Heart Church. And... Um, you know, like I said, I noticed a lot of them, and in doing my research, I found out there were, of course, other diners in the city of Malden. So, so speaking of the, uh, this Malden, we have an archival photo that I have not uh, seen before that Larry brought into the studio, and I think it's fantastic, this, this old school photo. So tell us a little bit about the, the Miss Malden in this photo here. Well, Miss Malden Diner was a, uh, I believe it was a 1940s vintage Worcester lunch car. Wow. And it was situated on Main Street just uh, past the Sacred Hearts Church. Uh, in fact, right next to the old Saugus Branch Railroad tracks that crossed Main Street. In fact, in that photo, you will see the uh, trolley coming up Main Street, and the trolley tracks are actually crossing the uh, railroad tracks right at that point where the trolley is coming. And uh, the Miss Malden is sitting just behind it. It was a barrel roof was the lunch car, bright red as I recall. Unfortunately, it's the only picture that exists. And uh, believe the diner itself disappeared sometime in the 70s. And you also t mentioned the lunchbox, and yes. the lunchbox is, um, what was it called before? Well, it was many names over the years. It was originally owned by somebody named McDermott. It could have been Al McDermott out of Fall River. He had many diners, and it was built in 1932, delivered to Wareham. But it may not have stayed in Wareham longer than six, seven years, and it was originally built with a counter and stools like a normal diner, lengthwise. And in about 1937 or so, the Worcester Lunch Car Company, which built the diner, reconfigured it to be more of a lunch wagon with a serving counter down one end with a kitchen behind it. Wow. And then stools along the windows and uh, a large, almost like community table in the middle. So it was kind of a unique experience uh, for a, a, a normal diner. It wasn't set up as a normal diner. and. This one here, when I first went to it, it was called Viv's Diner in the 1980s. And it eventually had other names like Lo Rose's Little Red Diner. Um, it was called Lulu's in the early 2000s, and then it became the Lunchbox Diner, which it is today. So when I mentioned that we were bringing on a, an expert on diners uh, to the show, people were like, they lit up. What, what, what is it about diners that people love? Well, diners basically are, um, you know, a democratic type of a place. Uh, any good breakfast and lunch place around here in, uh, you know, eastern Massachusetts or just central Ma uh, New England in general, diners are more known for breakfast and lunch. You go down to New York or Connecticut, there may be 24-hour places. But up here, it's mostly breakfast and lunch. And uh, Malden has the one diner, the uh, lunchbox diner, but there's other breakfast and lunch places around that people call home, basically, our second home. It's a, uh, you know, a local place to, you know, shoot the breeze and have a cup of coffee, talk politics, c talk whatever you want to talk about, hopefully not argue, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyways, you know, uh, this is a sense of community, uh, you know, uh, a trash collector could be sitting next to the mayor. You know, you just <laughs> don't know. It, it, that's the way a good diner, a good breakfast and lunch place should be. The people that, when I mentioned it, they mentioned the Linden Diner, um, mm -hmm. and th that wasn't a t like an old school diner. No, was... that is an on what we call on site. Uh, it, that's a storefront, just like the Doo Wop Diner on Main Street, okay. just past where the Miss Malton used to be. The Doo Wop Diner is today, and uh, back in the '80s, that was known as Steve's Diner. Um, those are what we call on-site. They aren't what a classic diner looks like, generally. But the food, 
the ambience can be diner-like, and that's what they, they go for. And, uh, you know, there's Robert's Broken Yoke down on Broadway, uh, Franny's in Maplewood Square. Uh, there's all, all these breakfast and lunch places. The Donut Villa over in Highland Avenue at the uh, shopping center, they're uh, good breakfast and lunch place too. So. so if you have not checked out Larry Coltrero's book, uh, Classic Diners in Massachusetts, yes. and there's also the new one as well. The new, new Hampshire. Hampshire Diners, Classic Granite State Eateries, yes. Uh, Fantastic books, and they, they go back historically. A lot of historic photos, and a lot of a lot of recent photos as well. So, thank you so much, Larry, for your time. Okay, thank you. Welcome back to What's New Massachusetts. So, Sharon, we're going to list our top five diners in Massachusetts. Sounds good. Are you excited? I am, because I, now I know <laughs> places to go. <laughs> <laughs> and we're actually going to rerun a clip that you when you interviewed Larry. Yes, that sounds wonderful. As, as I mentioned um, in the previous segment, every time I talk to Larry, I learn something new. And he's so passionate about diners. So it was a very intriguing and a very interesting interview. And in the interview, he actually had a formula of what makes a diner great. Mm -hmm. And we're going to we actually use that formula. A lot of it has to do with the, the look and feel, the historic yes. accuracy of the diner, mm -hmm. and then also the price. And the, yes. uh, So the five diners that we chose have those elements that Larry talks about in the clip. So mm -hmm. let's run that clip. Here we are now with Mr. Larry Coltrera, um, the author of Classic Diners of Massachusetts. Thank you, Larry, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Well, we talked a little bit before we came on. Now, you have a few favorite diners in Massachusetts. Why don't you tell us about a few yeah, of them? Yeah, well, you know, uh, I set up the book, uh, the chapters in geographical areas. So, you know, every area, the greater Boston area has, uh, say, the South Street Diner, 24-hour diner in downtown Boston. We have... Uh, uh, right here in Somerville, Massachusetts, we have Kelly's Diner. We also have Buddy's Diner right down the street. Uh, we do have the Rosebud in Davis Square. Unfortunately, I wouldn't classify that as a diner per se anymore. Why? The current ownership destroyed the interior of it. So, uh, the exterior looks great, but the interior is not diner-like. So, you know, uh, that being said, I hear great things about the food. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm not going to tell anybody not to go. Right. But if you're looking for a classic diner, the interior is not classic anymore. Well, the interior kind of makes the diner experience. Oh, I think so. It needs a counter and stools, and that one does not have it anymore. It does. Now, now let's get to the good part. Now, I love trivia. Now, we were talking about some classic movies that have used diners in some of the scenes. The movie Goodfellas, which was based out of the uh, New York... Uh, the La Cosa Nostra, Metropolitan New York, and there were two diners. Can you tell us about those? Well, one of them uh, now currently goes by the name Goodfellas mm -hmm. Diner, but uh, I don't recall what its original name was. Right. Uh, that was a sort of a 19, six, late 60s, early 70s diner, a large one, and there were a couple of good scenes there, but they also had scenes... Certain. In the airline diner, also known as Jackson Hole, and, and that was by LaGuardia. Yeah, right on, the on big the Astoria Boulevard. Yes, right. Yeah. Wow. And now you mentioned, I know, um, before the Blob, the movie The Blob, the Downingtown Diner, which no longer exists. No, uh, the the diner that was in that movie uh, was replaced by a newer diner a few years after that, right. and that diner is actually still on site, although. It I'm not even sure it's operating right now. Right. Um, nobody seems to know what happened to the old Downing Oh, but, it must be somewhere. There's some great old post. There's at least one old postcard of it. I used to have it in the collection, but I traded it to a good friend, so I don't have that anymore. Wow. But uh, uh, the Downing Town Diner, great, great old uh, diner. That was a great movie, a real campy sort of, I wouldn't call it sci-fi. It was semi horror movie, but it was fun. Uh, you know, with, uh, it was Steve McQueen's first movie, in fact. That's right. So, but uh, it was great when the, the diner came into view at the end. The blob tried to. That always frightens me. <laughs> now, now I'm going to ask you you've been doing this for such a long time. Yes. Where do you see the trajectory for your discovery of new diners? Where do you see it taking you? Well, it's 
pretty much leveled off now. Uh, I'm basically trying to uh, continue blogging with my blog diner hotline. Uh, I'm also currently scanning uh, all the slides and photos I've taken in the last 36 years. Oh, that must be a Quite the task. It is. Uh, I'm only partially done with that. Oh, I but bet. I'm uh, having fun doing that because I'm looking at pictures I haven't really seen in a long time. Right. And in fact, even some that I've scanned recently, I haven't really looked at them closely until mm -hmm. I've scanned them. And in fact, a few this weekend. And I said, oh, this is great. These came out fantastic from 1986. They're nice shots. Uh, there's my old van. I didn't know it was in the <laughs> shot, you know. That right. type of thing. So it's it's fun to revisit and uh, sort of remember these uh, these diner trips that I was on back in the eighties. So I mean, going on thirty six years. Well, in those thirty six years, let me ask you this: that's sort of part of the diner experience. Have you met anyone in your travels that has really stood out that brings back a really special memory? Oh, there's a lot of memories. Let me tell you. I mean. I, uh, you know, I've been interviewed for local TV like this, but I've actually been on CBS Sunday Morning. Mm -hmm. I've been in Smithsonian Magazine, but we've met a lot of different people over the years. Uh, my the people I consider my mentors uh, were the guys who were the initial people bringing out books back in the late '70s and early '80s. Wow. And uh, in fact, two of them, John Bader, a noted artist and photographer, put out the first book called Diners. He uh, wrote the foreword for my New Hampshire diner book. And Richard Gutman, who's considered the uh, foremost authority on the history of diners, took, did the uh, foreword for my first book. So, Do you think that diners will ever die out? Do you think that there will always be a place for diners? I hope so. I really do. I mean, there was a huge resurgence in popularity from the 1980s through the 90s into the 2000s. It seemed to be a leveled off a bit but i've always contended it doesn't matter if a diner tries to trade on a 50s nostalgia thing or, or whatever what they really need to do is provide good food at a good price and excellent service for a historic diner in massachusetts here's our top five picks capital diner located at 431 union street in lynn the Capitol Diner, circa 1928, is an old school diner on the National Register of Historic Places, and it's the last operating J.G. Brill diner car. Operated by the Fennell family since 1938, the Capitol serves up the classics like Eggs Benedict and Corned Beef Hash. Next is the Miss Worcester Diner, located at 300 Southbridge Street in Worcester. Folks in the Woo apparently love breakfast, and the Miss Worcester Diner serves up the classics for a reasonable price. Like some of our favorite diners in Massachusetts, it's another product of the Worcester Lunch Car Company, car number 812. The Miss Worcester was added to the National Register of Historic Places in 2003. Our third pick is the Salem Diner, located at 70 Loring Avenue in Salem. Salem Diner was saved from destruction by Salem State in 2014, and now the university owns and operates this historic icon, which is one of two remaining Sterling Streamliner Diners in Massachusetts. Our fourth pick, Charlie's Diner Bar and Grill. It started out in Wareham in 1948, then moved to Worcester until 2002, and since 2005, it's been serving locals in Spencer. Our fifth pick is Joe's Diner, located at 165 Center Street in Lee. One look at its iconic interior and you know that legendary Joe's Diner is legit. In fact, it was the inspiration for Norman Rockwell's painting, The Runaway. And welcome back to What's New Massachusetts. So, Sharon, we're gonna, we went old school with diners. We did. Now we're going to go new school. Yes, this is a little different. <laughs> so let me ask you something, uh, Sam. <laughs> what are these new restaurants about? Okay, so they're, they're, some of them are bars, some of them will have food, but they're mm -hmm. called their axe throwing bars. Do you believe it? Yes, you heard that correctly. Oh my People goodness. People take hatchets and they throw them kind of like darts. And you have alcohol, right. and I am, I'm kind of not sure how these things are going to work. I don't know if that's the perfect place for a first date. It might set, set a bad <laughs> precedent. I don't know. 
But it sounds interesting. They've been sort of taking off, so I wouldn't mind trying it once. Well, you speaking of like this is Valentine's Day month, so, the, <laughs> so I don't know hatchets and Valentine's Day. Like I don't know my bloody Valentine. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but these are really taking off across the area. So these are places where you go, and they call them arenas. They have these kind of um, blocked off areas to make it safe, mm -hmm. where they have a target, and they give you a hatchet, and you try to hit the center of the target. Now, the four locations, there's going to be one in Union Square. That's right, Urban Axe. Urban Axe, and mm -hmm. then we have um, Revolution Axe, and that's going to be in Everett. Exactly. And then we have the Agawam one, so it's, and then we also have Marlboro. Right, and which is called Half Axe. <laughs> This is an interesting name. So, and they're all owned by different companies. So this sort of underscores this idea that that these axe bars uh, slash you know eateries are really taking off. Perhaps people can go there to kind of kind of vent frustration, you know, but also have a good time with friends. And I I know I played darts in my past, and right. people get really competitive. So I can see people with the axes being really like competitive throwing them. Absolutely, <laughs> but like I said, as long as they keep them aimed at the target, everything is great. So we're going to check out a clip from the new uh, axe throwing bar that's happening in Union Square. It's called Urban Axes. Let's check it out. Some years ago, I was in Toronto visiting some friends and they said, uh, let's get some beers and go axe throwing. And the first thing was, really? Is that legal? Axe throwing as a sport really was born and developed in Canada, in Toronto. We went along and we had a, a hell of a great time. People would love this. This would be something great. To, uh, to bring to the US. The rules of the game are you throw against a partner. There's a bullseye target set up, so there was five points for the center, three points for the second ring, one point for the outside. People play multiple games and matches as part of a round robin tournament. The axe throwing is kind of like a bit of a side thing to the social aspect and the community aspect around it. I think the very first time the axe hits the board and it sticks, that thunk is just so, so exhilarating. Because, I mean, it's axe throwing, so it's f***ing fun. <laughs> and, uh, sorry. And welcome back to What's New Massachusetts. Sharon, that was an interesting show. It was. <laughs> we visited old school diners, and then we looked forward to these um, wonderful hatchet bars where people <laughs> could go and have drinks and throw hatchets at targets. But it's something that people have a choice to do. They can either do something old school or experience something a little new. That gives new meaning to my bloody Valentine. Right? It does. I don't know if I would go there for Valentine's Day, but uh, but it's something different. We have to check it out. Now there are several locations in the area that we can choose from. Yeah, so there's going to be one in Union Square. There's one Correct. in Everett mm -hmm. called Revolution, and then the one in Agawam is already open. Right. And then the Marlboro location is opening up in the spring. So we have four locations to choose from. Right. And the one in Marlboro, I like the I like the name of it, Half Axe. That's an interesting name. <laughs> But there are four, and there are four different companies that run, you know, each one separately. So this just underscores the the sort of popularity of this new type of bar. Yeah, I have to see it to really believe it. But we did r run a clip earlier. Yeah. People seem to be really into this stuff. So. I mean, it seems like a good way to work out aggression, but I don't <laughs> know if it's a good first date experience. I don't know about that yet. Yeah, so all a single folk will be at the axe throwing bar. Yeah, that sounds about right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of hatchets i'm doing a huge event this summer at the lizzie borden bed and breakfast in fall river yes now this is a little spooky because it's an overnight event yeah it's the it definitely is a it's july 7th and it's the lizzie borden bed and breakfast in fall river it is called paranormal showdown with lucky and sam and i'm working with my friend lucky belcamino and it's going to be fascinating uh, and you we talked previous to our taping today you said it's a little haunted yeah it's notoriously haunted in fact right. I, my last book 13 most haunted hotels and inns in new england right i was number one most haunted in the new england oh, wow and you're going to be <laughs> staying there that's oh my god fascinating because that's where the murders took place and i'm really fascinated with the crime and trying right. to solve the crime and uh, communicating with the spirit so we're going to um, actually run a clip from the Lizzie Borden Bed and Breakfast. Mm -hmm. But I hope you guys have a great month and we'll see you next month on Wesley, Massachusetts. Bye. Bye.
<laughs> hey guys, I'm reporting here live from the Lizzie Borden B&B. Um, so far it's been a pretty spirited evening. Uh, Lucky Bell Camino was here earlier, and oh my gosh, um, this place is off the hook with energy. Um, I heard my name multiple times, it was like Sam, 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 uh, multiple times, and then I saw what looked like a shadow figure that just kind of like darted by me. And actually the reason why I'm in this room, it's right by the, the murder couch, or the area where, the, uh, where Mr. Borden was murdered. And this is where I saw it. Lewis, I don't know if you see anything. But I saw a, sh like a shadow figure dart in here, and it kind of looked like a dart. So it was definitely um, a little scary for me. <laughs> to give you some insight, I had a dream about uh, staying here. I was actually called here by Bridget Bishop. And Bridget, no, sorry, Bridget Bishop's from, uh, from Salem. Sorry, uh, Bridget Sullivan <laughs> from, from Bridget. And Bridget was um, wanting me to come here. Um, and she basically wanted to confess, like to confess to her role in what happened. And according to the dream, there was an axe put into looked like a cistern or like a well in the closet and it turns out there is definitely um there's a closet in the room that i'm staying in that leads to a well and it's it's locked so hope, like it's not going to be able to uh be accessed but so i'm so scared right now <laughs> but i'm actually in the the what i think is the most haunted location uh, as far as bed and breakfast in New England, and I'm doing it, and I'm going to stay the night here, and had a very amazing conversation with Lucky about uh, just things in general, and it was just so good to reconnect with her, and I'm really grateful for, for all of that. So.